Thank you for joining us. Today is the 11th of October. This is CSC 241, and we're going to finish our concept review of module three and set the stage for your first attempt of the module three assessment. Yay! Okay, so uh, what you're seeing before you is an image of a Raspberry Pi. And a Raspberry Pi is a $35 computer that now has, it now has the power of a laptop five years ago. Now that's, that's you're gonna think that's an exaggeration, but it's not. Five years ago, we had laptops that did not have 4K video. Is that a correct statement or not? True or false? I mean, you might have been able to buy one somewhere, but and maybe Apple had a high-end MacBook Pro or a Mac Pro that had it, but it, for the general population, you, you wouldn't have a laptop with 4K video. It wouldn't have that kind of graphics capability, and it wouldn't have eight gigs. It would probably have four gigs, and it would have a traditional hard drive instead of a solid-state hard drive. The point I'm trying to make is that the Raspberry Pi 4 is still a, a $35 computer, complete computer. And what you're seeing here are just uh, images of this thing. Here's a schematic, right? And the CPU is basically a multi-core processor. It has four cores, I think. And um, so you can get it with eight, gigs of RAM, four gigs of RAM, or two gigs of RAM. The two gig of RAM model is $35. I think the four gig is $20 more and the eight gig is like $40 more. So essentially you have the horsepower of a laptop from five years ago and it's like 75, 80 bucks for the eight gig model. The reason that we're we're calling this out today is that when I come to St. Thomas next week, what I'd like to do is bring a Raspberry Pi. This would be a 3B plus, slightly, slightly lesser model. It'll have two gigs of RAM. It'll connect to an HDMI display, which could be a smart TV or just a TV, a flat screen TV. And it uses all of the power of a cell phone charger to operate. So if you are comfortable using a cell phone charger with your electric bill to operate this thing really only takes the same adapter that you would use to charge your smartphone, okay? And uh, one of the things we want to do is to give you a chance to get your hands on actual hardware, digital components, right? And we want to call out these things. We'll also offer the same to students on St. Croix. So don't think that because I'm focusing on St. Thomas right now and the OEK campus that I'm not thinking of students in our Albert A. Sheen campus. If you've never noodled with one of these and seen how much fun they are, you connect it to your TV. And if you have a cordless keyboard and a mouse, we have smaller, if you have little fingers, we have a small version. You know, we can give you. Uh, but basically, uh, you pull it up on your screen and away you go. And so you can do everything on this screen that you could on your laptop. And that's not an exaggeration. So you can browse the web, do email, write programs. You can actually do things in Mathematica, which is a similar to MATLAB, okay? There's also cool stuff on there like Minecraft and so on. So this is, we're trying to light a fire here, but we want, we want to inspire people to see just how far this thing has come. They just announced that the Raspberry Pi 5 has been released and it's probably gonna be out just before Christmas and it'll be the hardest thing to get your hands on um, other than an Xbox or a PlayStation, right? Are there any questions about the Raspberry Pi? No. This thing has dual 4K video ports. 
That's right. You can power two 4K displays with a Raspberry Pi, four, all right? Um, USB-C power supply, micro SD card slot, that's the hard disk. So that's the IO that boots this thing, right? The RAM is over here, right? So you have uh, one of these chips is RAM and one's the CPU or graphics controller or whatever. Um, yeah, and there are other diagrams that explain all this stuff. Gigabit ethernet, USB 3.0, uh, Bluetooth wireless, right? Wi-Fi built in, Wi-Fi built in. Stereo audio out. Oh, a camera port. Yeah, you can hook up security cameras to this thing. 35 bucks. All I can say is, wow. So I wanted to whet your appetite for what comes in our next module. And I wanna do that because I want you to see that before you go through these rapids to finish up module three, and you go down a little bit of a waterfall in your canoe, and that may seem a little terrifying because you know there's more to this last uh, module. Uh, once we get finished with module three, the HDL component and the complex create your own, build your own kind of thing, uh, we hit the pause button on that until the very end of the semester. So then we start getting into this stuff. We, get, we start getting into the actual hardware components themselves in module four. We get into the systems in module five, and then we cover special topics in module six. So I just thought it would be fun to share about that for a minute. Any questions before we continue with our review? Does anyone here recall that I said you could take different combinations of logic gates to build an, X, an XOR? Does anyone remember that? Yeah. If you ever wondered what an XOR diagram looks like, it has the OR shape. Everybody see that? Clearly an OR in the mix. And when you look at the diagram, the internal implementation view in our study guide, you see something like this, don't you? It's sort of a crisscross and then two ands and then an OR. And, and that's one way to build it. But here's another way to build it. Here's another way to build the XOR. You can split the A and the B inputs, feed them into an OR and a, and a what? A NAND, then come out of the OR and the NAND, and then come into an AND and then out. Now, why are we sharing this with you? There's more than one way to skin a cat. It's been said, not that we like skinning cats, but. The thing that I want to call out is that the XOR has the prominent OR shape, but then it has this extra curve behind that gives you the idea that something's going on with these inputs when they're fed into the OR. That's the thing to remember about XOR. Now, we explained that to turn this into an XNOR, all we had to do with this diagram is do what with it? Anyone? Add a knot after the OR? Yeah, I did that. At the Add end. a knot after the OR. Thank you very much. Yes, you could put an open circle right here. You could put an open circle right here, and that would flip this into an X NOR. It would turn it into an X NOR. Okay. Now, we said that XOR and X NOR were special. And we said that a lot of our communications and our encryption, in, in fact, uses XOR and XNOR. Um, but I will say this. We also said that you can use different construction options to build these things. You can use more internal logic gates or less internal logic gates, depending on 
your intent. And what I'd like to do now is take a quick side trip to student learning objective F, Foxtrot, where it says explain the significance of the arrangement using and and or logic gates in the casino example. Now, this is going to take a little bit. It's going to take a little bit to develop this, but I'm hoping that when you see this, everybody remembers the MUX, right? It stands for multiplexer. We can switch the inputs. That's the thing. And there we go. You've been reading the study guide, yes? Everybody's been reading the study guide? All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Here's the XNOR, yes. here is the XNOR logic gate. And the XNOR logic gate produces a true when the inputs match. I want you to see this. In this truth table, B1 and B2, Bravo 1 and Bravo 2, the truth table is real simple. We have two inputs, so we have four rows. We have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Everybody got that, right? Yes. And for the truth table, it says, Basically, hey, if the values match going in, I get a true. Put another way, XNOR is a logic gate that detects all the inputs are the same. Let's say that again. XNOR tells you in the blink of an eye if the values of the inputs are all the same. And there are cases where you need to be able to do that in a split second and it's vitally important, and that's a very cool behavior. Now, I know that it doesn't seem like much, and I'm getting riled up here, right? So if you're watching the video window of me bouncing around here, I just want you to say that between XOR and XNOR and a few other things, right? There's a digital flip-flop, there's a MUX. We didn't have a couple of these basic devices. We wouldn't have computers at all, whatsoever. None of this. All of this that you use, that you enjoy, from Raspberry Pis to smartphones to your streaming media, none of that would be working. We'd be working with, you know, I mean, it would be Stone Age kind of thing. Now, I want you to notice this funky little thing right here. If I put a link in the study guide, you need to click the link for the study guide. If there's a link in the study guide, make sure you take the time to do this because it's going to show you some important things you need to know and there are going to be assessment items from those links. I don't want to surprise you. I'm not pulling punches. I'm just telling you, if there's a link in the study guide, you're supposed to be memorizing the study guide and memorizing means clicking all the links. Now, how does XOR differ? Well, its behavior is the reverse. So... If you know an XNOR is a detector when all the inputs are the same, XOR does what, do you think? What do you think XOR does? Anyone? It detects when they're not the same. Correct. Yes. It detects when all the inputs are not the same. Now notice the wording. There could be just one input that's different, or there could be half the inputs that are different. An X or detects when all the inputs are not the same. When all the inputs differ from each other, there's at least a one or there's at least a zero and all the others are one and there's one zero and that's like, okay, I've got a single zero. It's not the same as all the other ones. And the XR goes, eh. yes, true. We have different inputs. 
So it's going to look at any combination, absolutely any combination, four bits, eight bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, 64 ones and zeros. And it's going to go in an instant, clink. It's going to say, uh, no, Houston, we have a problem. There's a difference. They're not all the same. That's true. That's true. They're not all the same. Okay. Which is something you also want in the blink of an eye. And we'll get to that more later. And then you're going to see a lot more of that when we get into networking in the spring. Okay. Any questions about XOR and the XNOR before we go to the casino? By the way, this is the mathematical operator symbol. The mathematical operator symbol that is used to represent X or. If you see a round circle with a crosshair, that's X or. Or if you see this, the carrot symbol. Now the carrot symbol looks like a rooftop. And if you hold down the shift key and look at number six on your keyboard, you'll notice there's a little rooftop right there over the number six. And everybody look at your, just humor me here. If you have a keyboard, look at your keyboard and say, oh yeah, it is, I see it. Everybody see it? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay. Now this is a segment of mine that I would consider to be like a favorite. We told you that you can make an XOR in different ways. And right now, what I'm gonna share with you, I hope it scares the nonsense out of some of you. I'm gonna say that again. What I'm about to share with you, I hope it's gonna be food for thought and you're going to take the time to read this page in the study guide over and over and over again, because it tells a kind of a story here. How many of you are familiar with casinos? Not one person in the class knows anything about a casino? Are you kidding me? Yes, I know. Yeah. You, know yeah. about a, you know about a casino, okay? All right, so there are some similarities. What I wanna do is I wanna ask you to look at the diagram on the left and look at the diagram on the right. When you look at the diagram on the left and you look at the diagram on the right, you're gonna see some things that are similar. First of all, there are eight inputs. Everybody see eight inputs? Yes. Okay, yeah. so what's two to the eighth? What's our what's our truth table size? Pretty dang big, right? Two hundred and fifty six rows, I think. Yeah, that's a big that's a big truth table. But one thing I want you to know is on the left hand closest to the inputs, what logic gate do we have in both cases? Do that? Those are ands along the left side. Everybody see here, here's an and, these are ands, and these are ands. Are they the same ands, yes or no? I have four inputs, A through D, going into a pair of ands, and I have A through D going into one and. What's the difference between the pair of ands here and this and there? What do we show you about the inside of an and like this? How are those ands connected together? Is this a reminder? 
the ends are connected in series. There's an and connected to another and with an extra input, and this does what? It connects to a third and. These are connected in series. Does everybody understand what I'm saying by that? This and has three ands strung together in series. Now let's look at this one again. Remember, we had series in parallel earlier in the discussion. Everybody remember? Everybody? Everybody? Serial? Parallel? Yeah? Circuits? Hello? 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 We have two ends side by side. Yeah? Is this in series or parallel? Parallel. Parallel. Parallel is correct. These ends are parallel. This and has three of them, and they're in series. Now, you're probably saying, okay, okay, all right. And now, what's the difference for the rest of this? Oh, in this case, we have three ors, and in this case, we have a single or. And you're probably thinking, yeah, all right, so what does this have to do with casinos? All right, so here's where I want you to put a cap on where you imagine some things. There's a device in a casino known as the one arm bandit. Does anyone know the, the common name for the one arm bandit? Slot machine. A slot machine, thank you very much. Is everybody still with us here? Yeah. Okay, slot machine. All right. Now here's something, this is one of those value added things where I'm hoping people will come away from this class and they're gonna be disturbed about what I share here, just a little bit, okay? So we told you that if, if you have an XOR, you can build an XOR differently because depending on the situation, you might want things to work a little differently, a little slower, a little faster, that kind of thing, right? Okay, do we have any poker fans here, probability fans? Yeah. Does anybody know about basic probability? Like, like if I flip a coin, what are the odds that it's going to be heads? If I keep flipping a coin, has anyone ever seen that kind of an experiment? What is it? I flip a coin, flip a coin. There are only two values. So 50% of the time it's heads, 50% of the time it's tails, but is it always heads or tails, heads or tails, heads or tails? intermittently back and forth back and forth and back and forth like that have you ever flipped a coin before have you ever watched other people flip a coin before what's the answer to that question it's it's random so there's no chance it's random it's just by chance. yes it's random so you can't be sure if it's heads all the time it could be heads 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 and then tails 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 and then heads tails heads tail tail heads over time, it's 50-50. That has to do with probability. Now, I want you to imagine there's a slot machine. And the number one goal of slot machines, the one-armed bandits, is that when you walk into a casino and you've never walked into a casino before, the goal of the casino owner is to hook you, grab you, make you an addict. It's actually good for business when so, and I know they have campaigns where they say, oh, please gamble responsibly. But does anybody make any money if you gamble responsibly? Have you heard the phrase, the house always wins? Yes. You have. Let's walk through, yeah. uh, uh, let's walk through a hypothetical case. Just a hypothetical case, and this is purely hypothetical, and I'm going to be stretching the boundaries of mathematics quite a bit. In fact, there might be some mathematics professors after they, if they were to watch this and say, nah, you, you, you broke some stuff. You didn't really stretch it. But, but the concepts behind it are, are what we want to pay attention to. I want you to notice that here we're using 
we're using four ands, and then here we're using three and three ands in series. Okay, so we actually have six ands over here, and they're in series. We have a single or, and over here we have more ors. Ors are permissive. You know that ors, ors will prove true if any any of the inputs is a one, right? So most often, ors are true. Everybody gets that, right? Yeah? Everybody understands that an or is different from an and because an and is usually more restrictive. Most of the time, an and's output is what? What does an and do most of the time? Five, zero. If, the, if we just randomly input different combinations of ones and zeros according to the truth table, like we're flipping a coin. If we're just putting in different combinations of ones and zeros, like we're flipping a coin, three out of four times the and is gonna go, nope, false, false, false. The or is gonna go, hey, true, hey, true, hey, true. So what we have is something that's more restrictive versus something that's more permissive. Now, if you know about probability, Okay, I want you to see this. Let's look at the first and. How many times is it true? It's true a quarter of the time, right? Didn't we say that? It's one a quarter of the time. How about the second and? True a quarter of 25%. the time? Yeah, 25%, right? And then... How about this one? 25%? Yep. Yeah. And how about this one? 25%? 25%. Yeah. Now, in terms of the laws of probability, when you have an event and it's like one in 25%, and then you have a related event and it's one to 25%, and they're related, right? The combination of them you add together, right? Now, I'm oversimplifying, but just hear me out here. If it's true a quarter of the time, true a quarter of the time, true a quarter of the time, and true a quarter of the time, let's pretend that you pull the slot handle, the one-armed bandit. Let's say that you enter eight values randomly. You pull the handle eight times. Now, I'm oversimplifying again, but I want you to say, all right, so, and I don't know if you can see me in the video there, but because I might be sharing and maybe the video isn't live, but you're pulling that thing eight times. That's what you're doing. You're putting in eight values from A to H. Everybody understand what I'm talking about here? A to H, okay. ones and zeros, random. You're just pulling the handle, you're just pulling the handle, you're just pulling the handle, and you're generating a one or a zero randomly, and you're doing it eight times, and it's being fed into the inputs A through H. Now, what I'm suggesting here, and this, again, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing, is if I have my logic gates built this way, and the first logic gate could be true a quarter of the time. The second one could be true a quarter of the time. The third one could be true a quarter of the time. And the fourth one could be true in the time. The odds are, according to probability, that if I feed in eight in each of those inputs, I have a four out of four chance of being true. Let me say that again. What's one, what's one out of four plus one out of four plus one out of four plus one out of four? Four out of four. It's four out of four. And why would it trigger true? Well, if I have just one true, just one, just one, it's a true. And why does that happen? Everybody see the ors here? Everybody mm -hmm. see the ors? So if any of these babies, the ands, any one of them triggers a true in those eight pulls, the ors will pick up on it, and the ors will go, oh, we have a winner. We got a true. It's a true. Four out of four times. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Now, let's pretend that you are a novice gambler, and you walk into the casino. Hear me out now. True or false, one-armed bandits are electronic machines. Yes? True. True. True or false, the house always wins. True. true. Yeah. True or false, 
a drug pusher gives away free samples to hook people. True or false? True. True. You like this true and false game? Let's take it home. Let's pretend that you have somebody you know is a novice. They walk into the casino and you want to give them a taste of your product. What do you want them to do in a relatively short period of time? Do you want them when? to spend their entire paycheck and not get anything? Would it be good for business if the newbies that walked into a casino without fail lost their shirts? Now, this is one of those rare occasions where if you don't see me jumping up and down, I'm going to stop sharing here because I want to jump up and down. I want you to see this. Would any casino make any money if the only time a new person for the first occasion walked into their establishment and they lost their shirts every single time? Would that be good for casino business? No. True or false? Yes or no? No. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. What does that casino have to do? That casino... Mm -hmm has to hook them. And if one-armed bandits, the slot machines, are true to their name, when someone new walks in, it's actually a good thing. Did you know the casinos give away free gift cards? Oh, hey, try the slot machines for free, just for an hour, right? What are they trying to do? Let's go back to the diagram, okay? Let's go back to the diagram. There's going to be a logic gate, a combination of logic gates. There's going to be some circuits in that electronic device. And what's going to happen is, is that people who need to win more frequently, oh, they're going to win. They're going to get that rush. The blood's going to flow. They're going to feel like, hey, today's my lucky day, right? They're going to win. But here's the fun part. Are you ready for the fun part? After they're hooked and now they're spending more, would you care to gander at what we have over here? If I have a four input truth table, are you watching this? Everyone, please. We're almost done and then we're finished for the class today. Because I want you to see this and I want you to know it intuitively. I want you to ruminate on this. I want you to reflect on this. I want you to think about it. We have a four input truth table. What's two to the fourth? What is it? Two to the fourth. How many layers, how many rows do we have in the truth table with four inputs? You know the answer. 16, right? 16. Let's look at this and versus that and. What are the odds now for this and with four inputs to be true? Oh, just for that. And it's true one sixteenth of the time. One sixteenth. One of the time. Yeah, one sixteenth of the time. Is that different from the other pair of ands? Oh yeah, it is. Because the other one's two out of four. That's one half. That's flipping a coin. This baby, the four input and is only true one sixteenth out of the time. If you feed ones and zeros in there randomly, that's what you get. And so let's take a look at the other end. It's one sixteenth plus one sixteenth. Now, what is that? That's two sixteenths chance of being true. If I follow the same process with this baby, and I'm using the ors, so anytime it's a true, hey, we have a winner. Only this time, it's only true one out of 16 times. And one out of 16 times is 260. What's the difference? If I pull the lever with the first model, I get a payday. If I just pull the lever eight times, I'm going to get a payday. Guaranteed. But with the other logic gate, the odds are only one in eight times, which means, all right, so I could put in eight pulls. Oh, I didn't get it. I could put in eight pulls. 
Up, oh, I didn't get it. I can put in eight pulls. Up, oh, I didn't get it. Eventually, when I do eight pulls, one out of those eight sets of eight pulls, are you hearing what I'm telling you? The first one lets you win guaranteed in the first round of eight pulls. What does the second one do? Oh, you losing some money at the casino. Yeah, you are. Maybe you don't lose your shirt. Oh, but you get some free drinks. Have you ever wondered why they give free food and free drinks at the casino? After a point, you ever wonder? Yeah, that's because it affects your judgment, right? You're more relaxed. You're not thinking about things. Look at this. The house always wins. If you have an electronic device and you want it to be true more often or true less often, all you got to do is work this junk as shown here. Now, okay, all right, so there are some qualifications and it's not that simple and I'm kind of bending the concepts or breaking some of them. You get the point. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? It takes eight rounds of inputs, not one round of input. So you will strike it true and be a winner, but you got to go eight times as long. Now, what do you think happens after you've won a time or two on that slot machine? Do you think they let the winner mode stay on that slot machine? Do you think? Okay, okay. I'm not getting an answer. So I got to go full on video mode, right? Stop sharing. Do this again, right? All right. So everybody see me, right? You're a casino owner now. Let's flip the question. Do you think a casino could stay in business if they let new gamblers win every time, every round, every round, every round? Do you think casino owners would still be alive and thriving today if that were the case? No, nope. of course not. <laughs> no. No, they wouldn't. They would not. So they can't afford to slam down new gamblers, but by the same token, they can't let a winning streak stay a winning streak, can they? And what's the ultimate rule? Oh, the house always wins. How do they win? Especially if some of the things you're using are what? They're electronic. They're electronic. It's not a physical thing like a blackjack table. It's not a physical thing like a roulette wheel. Okay, but even roulette wheels, there's something with magnets you can do. You've seen movies, right? The point I'm trying to make is, Yes, no, true, false. Some people know how to use this logic with the ultimate kind of cruelty, right? And what you need to understand in no uncertain terms is that you can use this for good or you can use this for evil. And I wanted to take a moment today to kind of color outside the lines, okay? I wanted to color outside the lines. Oh, nuts, I'm going the wrong way. 175, 200, there we go. I wanted to color outside the lines today. I wanted to show you how rich, how creative these tools are in terms You're of- You're not shaping. sharing the, the screen. I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Thank you for saying something. I want, well, you were seeing me on the video, right? Or no? No, you weren't. Yeah, I could see um, okay. the third person. Okay. That's good. Thank you for calling it out. I really appreciate that. I wanted to show you this, and I wanted to take the time to color outside the lines to explain how rich the combinations of these logic gates can get. And now you have a glimpse of how they can be used or yoked 
for good or for evil. So that's kind of why we want you to learn this and how you understand electronic devices when they fail or when they work, okay? It has to do with the design. And what you see here is same combination, same two logic gates, same two logic gates, ands and ors, that's all you got. Now, remember that when you're working those logic gates, everybody can see this, yeah? Yes. Here's, here's a logic gate that's in reverse order. It's or and, right? So the ors are first and then an and. This is the HDL. When you're doing your stuff or your solution, you're going to have a few more uh, details down here in the parts section. Okay. And that's just something we wanted to share with you as we bring the class to a close. I hope you had a chance to appreciate a little something different today. And um, this concludes our class. Based on what we've shared, does anyone have any comments or questions? Okay. Well, go ahead and take on the assignment and the solution. And uh, we will see you on Friday, right? I want you to read the rest of the study guide about this particular uh, topic, right? You read it on your own, and then that's it. And we're at the end of our study guide. Except for the part that has to do with your solution, there's an extra page at the end. I wanted you to see that, okay? All right. All right, thank you. Yes, take care. Bye-bye for now.